All right, guys, welcome back. So, okay, first time was a learning opportunity. I went back and looked at the video after I uploaded it to YouTube and realized that I was walking around a lot. Uh, that was crazy distracting. So um, I'm going to try to do this differently, but I'm going to sit down, be still. Um, that way you don't get motion sickness watching the videos. All right, so uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about uh, Shakespeare, okay? So I know that this is not a very popular topic. Shakespeare is not a guy that a lot of people uh, are fascinated about, not they don't get excited about him that often because, let's you know, quite frankly, the, the language can be sometimes hard to understand um but this is the way i want to approach it and, and this is the way i approach any any writer or poet or playwright um that i that i've com come into contact with and i'm really interested in um the best way that i found is to really focus on not so much that person to start out but to do a little background research what was the place like in which this this playwright he or she lived? Um, what was going on in the culture? What was going on politically? Because all of those things um, have an effect on a person's writing, whether you realize it or not. Um, they do on mine, uh, they, and they probably do on yours too as well. And even though you're writing essays in a class, uh, a lot of the issues and and politics and cultural changes they uh they affect your writing and a lot of times they're subliminal you don't even realize that they're going on um so let's talk a little bit about shakespeare and, and the time in which he lived so looking back at england in the latter part of the um 16th century going into the 17th century okay um there was a religious it was there was a huge political crisis going on at the time mainly because of religion okay uh queen elizabeth was on the throne um and for those of you who may know or may not know a lot about elizabeth elizabeth was the last tutor um who in the in the tudor dynasty to sit on the throne of england uh why is that important well because it all goes back to her father okay who is a, a man you probably do know about. Uh, he's the most famous um, monarch in English history. He wanted to be remembered, and he damn well is remembered uh, for many things, not the things he wanted to be remembered for, but he, he definitely is, and that would be Henry VIII. So, and this is right around the, um, the 15th century. Um, so moving into the early part of the 16th century so this I'm, I'm going to be quick about this so what was going on well the best way to describe England during that time was really if I can put it into modern terms would be the Game of Thrones okay and honestly the Game of Thrones is heavily based on England during this time really going back before Henry VIII came to the throne uh, it, a lot of it ended with his father Henry the seventh who was the first tutor um, who won the throne on the battlefield it, it wasn't because he had a birthright to it it's because he won it on the battlefield um, and he brought stability to England for a short time uh, as a result um, Henry the eighth was a person who was not meant to be king of England um, if you look at our current example of that with uh, in England William and Harry uh, which is a nickname for someone named Henry um, Harry was second in line just like Henry Henry the eighth was second in line um, he was not meant to be on the throne of England but because his older brother Arthur um, passed away because of an illness uh, Henry was all of a sudden cast into um, the limelight and he was a child who was sheltered. He, um, he wasn't really properly um, uh, groomed for the position. 
and um, he was a very selfish person, very vain. He was a typical Renaissance prince of this time. Um, as you know, Henry VIII um, was married to uh, Catherine of Aragon, whose mother and father was Ferdinand of Isabella. You probably remember that from history class. And it was a happy marriage, but Catherine was not able to give Henry the thing that he wanted the most, which was a son and heir. So Henry, over the course of this, was, went on for about a decade, and he finally got advice that he was desperately seeking on to be able to divorce Catherine and to marry um, his new love at the time, which was Anne Boleyn. Um, he was advised to just break away from the Church of Rome. And that's what he did. He remained Catholic. Um, and remember, England at this time was a Catholic nation. He was still staunchly very Catholic. However, he did not believe that a king should bow to a pope in Rome. Okay? And so he just divorced from Rome. Because of that, there was a lot of political and religious turmoil in England at the time. Henry was kind of like the leader we have now. He'd go back and forth a lot. Uh, he would change his mind on a whim and, and, and basically because of anger. And a lot of the repercussions from that is, well, he would swing back and forth between true Catholicism and more of the Reformation, the evangelicals of the time. So the reformers, the Protestants, you can call them, the Lutherans. Uh, he would swing back and forth, just depending on his his whole attitude and his, his personality at the time. Um, that kind of instability um, really played a large role in England becoming so politically unstable at the time. Um, it's, and it, it went from the aristocracy all the way down to the uh the common class the peasants and stuff so because you didn't know from one week to another whether you were going to continue the practices or change up okay so to make a long story short it started with henry the eighth um and then when he passed away his son edward came to the throne now edward was a very very young he was a teenager very sickly young man um but he was staunchly Protestant. His, his, he was raised by his uncle, and his tutors were all Protestants and staunchly Protestant. Um, they did not believe in Catholic traditions at all. And when he came to the throne, to the throne he pretty much undid everything his father uh, put in place and totally changed up the, the Book of Common Prayer, the, the church services, all of that stuff. Well... As I said, Ing Edward was a sickly young man, so he ended up passing away at the age of 14, I believe. His older sister Mary came to the throne. Now, she was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, and they were Catholic. She was militantly Catholic. Um, she did not like any of these changes, so she decided to go back and force everybody to go back to the Catholicism. So you can see the ping pong and the effects of the ping pong and okay back and forth. Uh, it, it caused a huge rift in English society. Well, fast forward to Elizabeth, and this is where it relates to Shakespeare. Um, Elizabeth came to the throne as a Protestant, but she came to the throne as someone who wanted to mend the divisions within her kingdom um, and she carried out religious policies very subtly okay in order to mend that rift okay and as, 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 as a result she was able to create a lot of stability in England in fact they call her reign the golden age okay and it really was it was a very stable time to be in England at the time um, yes the, the religion had changed a lot, which was embedded, you know, with ingrained within their culture. But the the changes that did occur were pretty welcome, um, and people were generally happy. So this is the time in which Shakespeare lived. Okay, Shakespeare uh, had a, and I apologize for there's still some delivery trucks, you know, coming through delivering stuff. So I apologize for the noise in the background. 
Um, the, um, where was I at? Oh yeah, okay. So Shakespeare. Shakespeare had a lot of content, okay? Shakespeare was very well versed in the history of England and all of the political turmoil and religious turmoil that uh, came about as because of Henry's break from Rome and uh, and then the time that bloody um, not, not Bloody Mary but Mary the first was on the throne she was referred to as Bloody Mary um, so he, he was very well versed in a lot of the history so a lot of that had an influence on his writing the other thing that you have to remember is this is a time in which renaissance culture really started to take off in England and it changed the way that men and women interacted with one another in society so in the medieval time periods everything was very formal you starting to see in the renaissance time that formality is still there but personal relationships become a little more casual and they become a little more relaxed and you can see that in um, some of the writings um, uh, that Shakespeare talks about. So, uh, again, there's a lot more to Shakespeare. Uh, I'm not trying to dumb it down or trying to water it down, but, you know, in the interest of time for this video, um, I want to get to his um, poems. So, the thing about Shakespeare is, is all of his poems were pretty much sonnets, okay? So, the sonnet is the most popular form of poetry that we have. Um, they are basically 14 line poems, okay, and separated by two sections, okay. The first 12 lines are three quatrains, and what we mean by three quatrains are three, I mean, four lines of poetry that have a common theme or a common point that's being made and they alternate in the rhyme scheme a b a b um and then the other two quatrains kind of continue on with that theme and and point and they have a different rhyme scheme so we go c d c d and then e f e f okay and that's basically um the three quatrains to to do really give you a good example of it it's about it's, it's very similar to a paragraph okay you're starting off with that central point and then you're working your way down with a body of evidence like you do in your essay writing um, the sonnet is flipped okay so you have all this body of evidence at the top in in the in the first three quatrains in the first 12 lines of the poem and then at the very end that's where the thesis statement that William Shakespeare is trying to make is located. That thesis statement is in that final two lines, what we call a heroic couplet. Okay, um, at the very those, those last two lines, G G, rhyme, and they are the central point. They are the main thesis. Okay, and that's basically the structure of a sonnet. Is the first twelve lines is like your essay. You got your body of evidence in there, and then the last two lines. Are your heroic couplet that's where your thesis statement that's what the whole poems about and that's basically what Shakespeare's trying to say okay so for the first poem shall I compare thee to the summer's day I'm gonna read these sonnets to you and then I'm gonna briefly talk about them really quickly okay so um, the first poem shall I compare thee to a summer's day is located on page 498 of your textbook Okay, let me read it to you. Um, and here's a little quick um, piece of advice. When you're reading the poem, you don't want to read the poem like your third grade teacher or your fourth grade teacher did back in school. Okay, Mary had a little lamb, this fleece were white as snow. That, I mean, you, you don't want to read a poem like that. I understand it's written in, in a certain way. Um, and it's got a meter and a rhyme and you want to respect that but really to understand the poem you want to read it like it's an essay you want to read it like it's just normal prose okay and I'll give you an example of that as I'm reading through um, the first one okay so like I said on page 498 uh, shall I compare these to, to a summer's day it goes like this uh, shall I compare thee to a summer's day thou art more lovely and more temperate 
Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often in his golden complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor possession, nor loose possession of that thou fairest owest, nor shall death brag thou wandereth in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this poem, and this poem gives life to thee. Okay, so what is Shakespeare trying to do? Well, remember in my introduction last week, these are all about love. Okay, but love comes in different forms. Um, you can have the kind of love that a parent has for a child. You can have the kind of love that a creator has for a creation. Uh, you can have the kind of love that a brother or, you know, has for another brother, you know, sibling uh, love. Or you can have the romantic kind of love that exists between, you know, a courtier and a courtee. Um, basically, that's what happened in this time period. Okay, you would, you you didn't rush into love. You you let it mature and you let it marinate and you let it grow naturally, kind of like you do with your plants in your garden. Uh, and that's what Shakespeare's doing right here. But he's talking about the a sense of love that is almost idealistic okay and he's and he tells you that in the very first line can i compare you to a summer's day well you can but when you look at the at the body of evidence he's talking about um you know sometimes the hot eye of heaven shines and often his gold complexion dim so you have a lot of imagery and a lot of symbolism that really go over the top um and really kind of demonstrates what kind of love he's talking about here he's talking about lust and he's talking about uh an idealistic kind of love okay because honestly and realistically you can't compare how someone looks and your your perception of them looks according to using things that you see around in nature i mean because that's just not how it works you know people don't work that way um but at the end of the day he's not really he, he's kind of doing that but he, he's playing okay it's very playful like i said this is a very idealistic viewpoint of 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 love um and he really sums it up at the at the very end. He's like, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this poem and gives life to thee. In other words, when she dies, you know, when she becomes old and gray and then she dies and she's buried and generations passed, he's basically saying, my ideal perception of you will live on through this poem. Okay? And that's basically what... He's saying, and, and that's that's his whole point for the poem, okay? Um, contrast that with the second one, okay? The second one's totally opposite, all right? And that one's located on page 568, all right? And this poem is titled, My Mistress's Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun. And I want you to listen and take note of how the language changes versus the first one, Okay? And it goes like this. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are dun? Dun is uh, a archaic word for uh, something that's colored like a mouse. Okay, so it's kind of dingy. All right. So, yeah, he's comparing her breast to, you know... No, she's not white complected as snow. She's more mouse colored. Uh, if her hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. Um, I have seen roses damask red and white, but no such roses I see in her cheeks. And in some perfumes there is more delight 
than in the breath that comes from my mistress reeks. I mean, he's basically saying she stinks. Um, she's pale. Um, she's not very pleasing to the eye. He says, I love to hear her speak, yet I, I, well, I know that music have far more pleasing sound. Okay. So he's going to even take it a step further saying every time she talks, it's, it's not music to my ears. It's just like, uh, you know, um, and I grant, I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. In other words, if I'm trying to compare you to a goddess who floats in the air, well, my lady love is, is definitely not a goddess because she walks on the ground. You know, all of these are things that are just compounding one on another. You see what he's doing here. He's being realistic about the person that he's talking about, but he flips it. In that heroic couplet at the very end, he flips it. He says, and yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. In other words, I love her regardless. And if I choose to compare her falsely to things that I know she's really not like, um, maybe my feelings are really false you know I'm just in love with the idea of her and not with the reality of what's really there so what can we say about these two poems well there's a maturity you can see a maturity that happens between the first sonnet which was probably written earlier on and, I, and if I'm not mistaken it was um, so he's not as idealistic about love as he was the first time around Okay, this one is more realistic. This one is that, despite all of the all of those things, okay, she may not be the most pleasing thing to look at. She may not be, you know, music may not come from her mouth every time she speaks. But I love her regardless, and if I ever compare her to false things, then my love can be false as well. So you see that progression, okay? Now, the third poem is probably one of my favorites all right because it really talks about what love truly is okay and it's called let me not to the marriage of true minds and i, I swear this is my one of my favorites let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with a remover to remove oh no it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose worth unknown, although his height be taken. Love is not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks with his bending sickle's compass calm. Basically, he's talking about time, the bending sickle, like the, the symbol of Kronos, the father of time, when time comes, okay? Um... Love alters not with its brief hours and weeks, but bears it out until the edge of doom. Okay? That body right there in those 12 lines is saying, Love is what it is. It is a spiritual thing. It comes from our Creator. It come in Shakespeare's time, it came from God. And the love that a creator has for his creation is the same thing that we should have for one another okay that is the essence of true love it's not the image that's caught up in the courtly love with the games that nobility play with one another you know with the writing of poems and the giving of gifts that's not what love is love is what it is okay it exists in the space between people. It exists in the space between the creator and his creation. And he sums it up perfectly. He says, if this be error and upon me proved, then I never writ, right, nor no man ever loved. Okay? At the end of the day, I think this is the most perfect poem that Shakespeare or anybody has ever written about the whole topic of love. And it was written at the latter part of his life. 
in a time when Elizabeth uh, was nearing the end of her life. Um, actually, no, this was written about six years after her life, uh, her death. Um, and he was looking back on that time and that stable time and, and where he started out and where he ended up. And uh, these poems document his life. You know, he started out as a foolish young man, like most of us men do, writing silly little lines of poem to or poetry to to charm a lady. Then in the second poem, you see him becoming a little more realistic and saying, "Well, no, I don't have to lie to someone to make them love me or to express how I love them. I can be real with them, and I can just come out and tell you, hey, despite all these things, I love you." And then near the end of his life, he realizes that, oh, it actually goes a step further than that. It's the space between all of us. And I can't think of a more appropriate poem than this one, the last one, for what we're going through right now. You know, in this era of social distancing, we are physically separated. But you know what? That love is still there. I see it. I've seen it on TV and in the news with the acts that some people are carrying out to help other people. It's like Shakespeare's poem here is validated. Right there in the last two lines. If this be error and upon me prove, then I never writ nor nor man ever loved. Because that love that exists in the space between all of us is the true love. It's that connection, that human connection that surrounds us all okay all right so i'm going to cut this uh, it's been about 30 minutes um i don't want to go on long diatribes like i always did in class so um i hope you enjoyed this explanation about the three different poems that we looked at for this week um drop me you know some comments in the uh, in the comment section in the video down below uh, if you have any questions, if you have any comments about the about the poem, or if you want some more explanation about, you know, maybe what a couple of the lines are. Now, one real quick thing, um, because the language of Shakespeare is is archaic, um, you you can go on Google and look up some of the words that kind of throw you for a loop. Okay, um, most of them will be in there. If not. Uh, definitely drop me a line and I'll explain what he's what he means by a certain word and in, in the certain context that he's using it okay um, again I hope everybody's safe uh, please stay at home don't don't get out unneedlessly um, now is not a good time to do that uh, and if you need anything please email me please call me let me know how you're doing um, and if you have any questions about the content again you can Put them down below in this video or you can shoot them to me in an email privately okay well thanks i hope you have a great weekend and i'll see you guys next week